what um, what do you guys know about depreciation? How do you think about depreciation? And how is it different from amortization? So I'm getting all the questions from you guys. Depreciation, depreciation from the income statement versus the cash flow statement, how do you use it, how do you think about it? I'll handle this. What is depreciation? Is it for depreciation that it's kind of like the wear and tear of physical the physical capital so like the buildings or machinery or equipment? Yeah, it's it's wear and tear of property. Right? You have property and the value of that property as it ages will reduce. Right? So how do you account for that? Right? Depreciation is accounting for the aging of that property. Right? So how does that work? So the, the formal definition of depreciation is accounting for the aging of your property, plant, and equipment. How does that accounting work? Do you have any idea? Say again? Okay. Well, if it's a straight line, you just assume that the useful life is, let's say, five years, and you depreciate about 20% of the value over that time. Yeah. Nothing. Yeah. But um, I don't know what double declining is, but yeah. the acres, I think, has like an adjusted over year, like the first year might be, well, it depends on, on how many years the life is, but the first year is a smaller amount usually, the second year is a pretty large amount, and then it kind of declines from there percentage-wise. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So there, there's several ways to calculate what the depreciation on the property would be, and the most common way is straight line depreciation. Right, so you have an asset, in this case, I have a truck, whatever is $20,000. And usually when the, when the asset gets appraised, the appraiser will also estimate what its depreciation in life would be. How long will it last and be used for operations? And let's say that its life was, was expected to be 10 years. Straight line depreciation says, take the value of the property, divide it by its life, and that's its annual depreciation. Right? So in other words, if it costs $20,000 and its life is 10 years, then it's expected to depreciate it at $2,000 a year. Now, so, so in other words, if you want to take an example, let's say we have an, an income statement, and let's say we have this truck, right? so the truck pp e would be $20,000. And let's say we, we've, we've raised debt to fund the truck, right? just way to balance your balance sheet, right? So that's the truck, and that's the debt, right? So let's say after year one, that truck depreciates by $2,000. You could very well be asked this in an interview. Depreciation is $2,000. How do we get that? Straight line. 10-year useful life. So 20,000 divided by 10 is $2,000. How does that, how do you wire that through your income statement, cash flow statement, and balance sheet? How do you think that would work? Yeah. And the, the scrap value or residual value is the idea that maybe by year 10, the truck isn't worth zero. It's worth some minimal value that I can trade in for it or I can kind of sell it. And let's say that that scrap value is $5,000. So whatever, whatever scrap value exists, you remove from the, from the depreciation calculation. So if you have, in this example, you had a truck that was worth 20000 And typically to calculate a straight line depreciation, you would divide it by its useful life of 10. Well, which gives you 2,000. Well, if I had a scrap value, let's say at the end of the, by year 10, let's say the idea is by year 10, um, you don't, it's not worth zero, it's worth some minimal $5,000. Well, that's the scrap value. Well, so the idea is you subtract the scrap value from the core value before dividing it by its useful life. So the idea is Usually, if it didn't have a scrap value by year 10, it would be worth zero. But if it has a scrap value by year 10, it should be worth five. So what you really want to do is just depreciate the 15,000 by 10, which means it's the, the depreciation is 1,500 each. So 
By year one, this is going to be 13.5. By year two, it's going to be 12, et cetera, et cetera. So by year 10, this is not going to depreciate until it's zero. It's going to only it's going to depreciate and end up with $5,000. So the idea is if there's a residual value, you want to subtract that value away from the value that you're depreciating. Generally, um, generally, well, it's on the one. So generally, the, the, the formula is always Well, it's always am I going wrong? What did you bet? There you go. Here. I thought I had written out the formula. I guess it didn't look. But it's it's the core value of the truck minus the residual value divided by the life. That's straight line, right? If the residual value is zero, then it's core value of the truck minus zero. But just always always note that it's core value minus residual value divided by U square. That's depreciation, right? That's how depreciation works. There are, that's straight line depreciation, right? There are other possible ways of depreciating assets, right? The straight line depreciation idea is the asset will depreciate evenly over time. But there's a concept of accelerated, accelerated depreciation. The idea of accelerated depreciation is maybe some assets depreciate faster in the earlier years and slower in the later years, right? So, you know, Actually, trucks is a good example of an asset that might depreciate, that might accelerate depreciation. It might depreciate faster the first few years and less in the later years. Right, Bill? He knows about trucks. Um, and so there are several ways to accelerate depreciation. One is the double declining balance. Right? And I'll, I'll briefly explain the method. <laughs> But I want you to really focus on straight lines for now, and we'll model out straight lines. But the idea of double declining balance is it'll depreciate faster in the early years and slower in the later years. So at the end, you're depreciating the same amount, but you're just depreciating more earlier. So that gives you more tax deductions earlier, and that hopefully that falls in line with the idea that the assets might depreciate faster earlier. So the idea of double declining balance is you would basically take the reciprocal of the useful life. Right, 1 divided by 10, which is 10%. And you double it. So the depreciation is 20%. That's the, that's the general idea of double design balance. I'll run through it briefly. Let's model a straight line. And then I'll, I'll do this again. And it's also in the book. So the way double declining balance works is Let's say the asset value is twenty thousand. Straight line. So the asset value is twenty thousand. And in year one, that's about twenty thousand. You'd multiply that by twenty percent, right? So that's a depreciation of four thousand in the first year. Twenty percent double. <clears throat> it's literally double. Remember, the straight line depreciation was two thousand. And then what you do in year two, so with the, with the double declining balance, is you'd depreciate the leftover. <clears throat> so you're going to depreciate 16,000 because it's, it's the remaining balance after the 20,000 has been depreciated. So you get 20% of 1,600 is 3,200. You depreciate that. That's the declining balance. And then in year three, we depreciate the remaining balance at 20%. Right. <coughs> so that's two. Right. And then so on. And then, you know, by year 10, it would approach zero. The problem with double time balance is it really never gets to zero, but you get close enough. So what's happening is it's real high depreciation in the beginning, and then it gets smaller, smaller, smaller. And there'll be a point by like year five, year six, well, it'll be going to be year five, where the, the, um, this will start to come close and start tipping underneath what the straight line would have been. 
underneath 2000. So you're accelerating in the beginning, but then it's going to be less depreciation later on. That's the idea of accelerating depreciation. That's one method of accelerating depreciation. Another method, which is the US, the method in the US, is the modified, so this is the IFRS, basically IFRS we use double declining balance. Um, you can do double declining balance, you can also use, instead of doubling it, 1.5 times, a multiple of 1.5 instead of doubling it. We'll look at these things as we model it. The other method, the method that we use for Walmart, the, the US method, is the maker is the modified accelerated cost recovery system. This is a set of percentages that, that are distributed by the IRS. You can look it up, you can Google what those percentages are, and you, you strictly apply those percentages by the core value of the asset. So it's not a declining balance. It's I'm going to erase this. This is on the book, by the way. They will give you percentages that you would apply. So they'll give you like 25%, 22%, 17%, 12%. And then you just apply the core value of the asset to that. And the percentages, as the percentage gets smaller, the depreciation gets smaller. That's the modified accelerated cost recovery system. Predefined percentages calculated for distribution. Right? Those percentages vary depending on the useful life of the asset. There's a maker schedule for an asset that has a 10-year life, a maker schedule that has an asset of a 20-year life, etc. So there are several benefits for accelerating depreciation. One is you truly believe that your assets depreciate earlier, you get more tax benefits. The second is in order to create a deferred tax liability. So we'll talk about that. But let, let's get to the modeling and focus on um, straight line depreciation. I want to show you how to use straight line depreciation. I want to show you how to use straight line depreciation for Walmart as a tool to get to an expense that's, that's appropriate, which is something a lot of people struggle with. Um, but first, let's just lay out the core straight line depreciation. And the first thing you want to do I don't know why this is kind of hanging in here. You can delete that. Is pull in the core value of the property plant equipment that the company has. Right? So we didn't do that yet. We don't have the balance sheet yet. So we need to go to the annual report of Walmart and look for its property plant and equipment. So, go back up to the balance sheet. So, oh, I have the set, so I'll go back to the balance sheet. I guess I didn't save that. Okay, so that's not, here's the balance sheet. So, what you want to do is you want to start with the, the net value of pp &E, not the gross value. So here, not every book company breaks it out this way, but Walmart uh, broke out the gross value, this is the original value of the property, less the depreciation that's been accumulated over time. The way we do it in modeling is we focus just on the net value, the 109603. What I'm also going to do is I'm going to simplify this, and I'm going to combine all the property together. So they broke up their property into two buckets. Their PP&E and the property that's under capital leases, that's also up for depreciation. The reason why I'm combining it is because the depre I know the depreciation that they've reported that we've analyzed, the 8105 on the income statement, that depreciation consists of depreciation under property and under capital leases. If you saw that the company had separated out depreciation into two buckets, which they rarely do, then you're going to have to create two depreciation schedules. Walmart didn't do that. I couldn't find the depreciation breakout. Every depreciation that they reported was, was a combination. I know that because when you, you got to do some research, when you Google around depreciation, there's a note on depreciation that says it's the combined depreciation of their property and their property under capital leases. So I'm going to combine these net properties together. So I know we didn't talk about the balance sheet yet, but what I want to do first is I want to just put the PP&E in its proper place in the balance sheet. I don't want to spend time layering in hard code in the balance sheet yet. I want to put the PP&E in its proper place, so when we 
go and actually model out the balance sheet. We'll have the right numbers there. And, and I just want to let you know that I'm going to, this is the net pp &E. This is also part of their pp &E. well, the capital leases. Right. So what I, what I want to do is I want to go into the balance sheet tab. And I'm going to lay out under net pp &E, row 14. So we'll, we'll spend a day on analyzing the whole balance sheet. But just this net pp &E is going to be a hard code of their total pp &E. That I'm going to combine the pp &E, what they define as net pp &E, and the pp &E under capital leases. And again, the reason why I'm combining that is because this is for purposes of depreciation. And Dave on the income statement combines all their depreciation into one lump sum. I couldn't break it out. So their pp &E is going to be a sum of their 109.603 plus 2721. I'm going to combine that. 109.603 plus 2721. So I'm going to do equals 109.603 plus 2721. Just hard putting it right in there. 109.603 plus 2721. I'm going to hard put it in the balance sheet. So I don't have to hard put it somewhere else and then go back and hard put it again. I do not recommend hard putting the same number of two different places. So I'm thinking ahead knowing it's going to have to be hard put here. So let me just hard put it here now. You don't have to have that expectation when you're model. You could have hard put it somewhere else and realize later and then fix it down. That's fine. 109.603 plus 2721. And this will be used to drive our depreciation because this is going to be the core property that we have to depreciate. So if we look at the depreciation schedule, there's a couple sections here, right? It's the property, it's the property plan and equipment. That's going to be our core depreciation. It also asks for the CapEx. Right? The CapEx is future property plant and equipment that will also be depreciated as it comes in. So a depreciation schedule is going to get a little complicated because there's really two pieces of information we're going to depreciate. One, the, the property plant equipment that's, that's in place and operating and existing. And then two, the future property plant equipment that we've, that we've estimated as capital expenditures. Remember, capital expenditures is the future acquisitions or build of PP&E that will be utilized for our operations. So we'll lay out the property plan equipment and the CapEx here in the first two rows. We're going to analyze what its useful life will be in the PPD and CapEx section. And then we're going to depreciate. And the depreciation schedule is a little bit complicated because we're going to have depreciation on the PPD, just like we discussed in the board. We're also going to depreciate each level of CapEx as it comes in. That CapEx is going to symbolize future property that will also have future depreciation. We will have to depreciate that. So first thing, let's, let's pull in the core value of pp &E that we've established on the balance sheet. So in F6, we're going to pull this in from the balance sheet. We're equals from the balance sheet, that 112 that we hard coded. Again, you could have hard coded it directly here. I'm just thinking ahead saying, I know it's going to end up building a balance sheet anyway. I don't want to hard code twice. I guess you could have hard coded it in here and linked it back. That's fine. I mean, you can do it several times. That's what you read. Yeah, no, I don't know why I tried. It should be broken. Or black. I also want to pull in for later the future capital expenditures that we've, that we've calculated from the cash flow statement. Now, 
On the capital statement, the capital expenses are negative. I want to pull them in as a positive number. So I want to pull them in on the minus sign. So in G7, I'm going to hit negative. I go to the cash flow statement. I'm going to go to G20. I'm going to copy that separate. So these are the, the core values of copy that we're going to depreciate. So, so the way I think about this is, first of all, we have this property that will depreciate. That depreciation will be an expense for 2013, 14, 15, 16, 17. Then in 2013, we projected that they're going to build or buy $14 billion of more property. That's going to have depreciation as well. So we're going to have to depreciate that as it comes in. In 2014, we're going to have more depreciation on that property, which will depreciate even further. So we have, this can be confusing if it's a French pencil. So we have basically, let's say about $200 billion in property in the beginning. That will depreciate. And so on. Right, so we need to calculate the depreciation. Let's say we divide it by 10. Right, so 20 billion. So we're going to have depreciation of 20 billion, 20, 20, and so on. Right, we're going to have depreciation of 20, 20, 20, based on that core property. But more is happening, right? We had 15 billion in 2013 of CapEx, let's say. Right? The idea of CapEx is this is property that's going to be improved upon or purchased or acquired during 2013. If that property is going to be acquired, that's going to add on more depreciation. Which let's say we divide that by 10 years. So there's going to be an additional 1.5 in depreciation. Depreciation is an expense that once incurred, it's going to continue to happen over and over again until this has been depleted. Then the next year, in 2014, we're going to have an additional, let's say, 20 billion in property that's going to depreciate as well. So we're going to have depreciation on the 20 from here. We're going to have depreciation on the 15. And then we're going to have depreciation on the 20. But that's not going to start until 2014, right? Do you always go by the beginning of the period? Say again? Do you always go by the beginning of the period? Uh, not always. I'll talk about the timing in a second. Then let's say the next year we purchase more property. That's CapEx. And that's going to depreciate as well. But that's not going to depreciate until 2015 until that property is going on. So by 2015, we're going to have the property on 200 that's going to depreciate, the 15 that's going to depreciate, the 20 that's going to depreciate, and the 30. So, so we total up these columns, and that's going to give us total depreciation. As you build more property, that depreciation is going to accumulate. That's the idea. So the first the second question is at what rate do these items depreciate? And that's an issue. That's an issue for several reasons. Because if we search for property in depreciation, we'll always, we almost always find a note on it. Here it is. Property plan and equipment. Um, the following detail. The product plan um, equipment it includes estimated useful lives, by which are generally used to depreciate the assets on a straight line basis. So one thing 
nice. They did a straight line. That makes it partly easy for us. That's why we're building a straight line depreciation schedule. But the problem is, look at these ranges, right? Three to 40 years, three to 25 years, three to 15 years. That's not going to help us. We can do three years, we can do 40 years. There's a low and there's a high. Um, there's a couple reasons why it's going to be impossible to back into that. Let's build the table first and I'll show you why. For now, let's take an arbitrary midpoint. Let's take 20 years, somewhere between 3 and 40 years. I'm going to show you how to think about it and back that and tweak it. Let me just make sure you have a good understanding of these mechanics before getting into the detail of Walmart. So let's assume for now that the straight line depreciation on everything is 20 years. And then we'll go in and show you how to tweak those numbers. So what I want to do is in 2013, the useful life for PPE years, because this depreciation is going to come in in 2013, I'm going to assume is 20 per month. So I'll put 20 in there. And I'm going to have existing depreciation in 2013 on that PPE of the 112324 divided by 20. So the existing PPE is going to be equal to the 112 divided by 20. Straight line. And now we want to set this formula up so that when we copy this to the right, we want to make sure that the, the references don't shift because whatever straight line depreciation is calculated here will be the depreciation for the next 20 years. So we want to anchor the references to these formulas, right? Because we want to copy, be able to copy this to the right and not have those references shift. How do we anchor formulas? We put dollar signs in the formulas where you can hit F4. So I hit F4 for the denominator. I put dollar signs in the denominator. Oops, I lost it. F4 in the denominator. And then F4 in the numerator. I'm going to hit enter. So that when I copy this to the right, we've estimated that PPD will depreciate at $5.6 billion a year. When it's straight line depreciation, once you determine what it was, it'll stay fixed at $5.6 billion. So that's why you can anchor it, but put those acres and something there. Yeah, that's right. So we'll, we'll do the acres underneath. Oh. <clears throat> so the idea here for PPD is. This is the net value. This is the end value of PPD in 2012. We're going to use that ending value to calculate next year's depreciation. And that will be the depreciation going forward. That's the idea. So we're almost redepreciating for scratch. There's a reason for that. This is the reason is we can't back into it any further, and we'll talk about that. <coughs> now with CapEx. Timing becomes an issue, right, with CapEx. Um, let's assume, we're going to assume, I, I used a separate, a separate row for CapEx. So that's 20. And I'm depreciate the CapEx at 20 underneath. Mm -hmm. <coughs> what I'm assuming for CapEx, and, and timing is, is, is an issue, or is something to be concerned about. Um, this CapEx again? That comment. Is he right? Tom, Tom, Tom. Well, I mean, but my, my assumption is, is it, if that is proper planning equipment at the beginning of the year, should the 2012 number be? Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Tommy, I see that in call. Thank you for clarifying. You mean we could have moved this into 2013 because <coughs> it's the beginning of the year? Because that's what yeah. Because because the end of year 2012 is the beginning of year 2013. Okay, as long as the calculations are right, you can you can move this into 2013. It won't impact our analysis, but yes, technically, maybe that should be over there, and then I should have changed this. The G. I don't know what did I do in the book. Did I put it in that in 2012? I'm not sure. Either way, it won't change the numbers. But good point. beginning of the year. Right. And that, the 112 report at the end of the year is the same as the 112 report at the beginning of the year. 
this is the beginning of here, so that's 2014. Right. Um, so with the CapEx, now this 14 billion in CapEx doesn't come in in the beginning of the year, doesn't come in in the middle of the year, doesn't come in at the end of the year. In reality, it's probably spread out over a whole year. So you might want to make an adjustment to that. I am just making the quick assumption that no matter when it comes in, which is conservative, let's assume we're taking the full hit of depreciation. Um, and what a lot of people might do is, in the first year, take half of that or a quarter of that, and we'll do that in the maker schedules. But for now, to keep it simple, I'm going to take that full depreciation and divide it by 20, assuming that whether this comes online in the beginning or the middle or the end, this wouldn't come on the line in the end. This came on the line in the end, it would be 2014. Let's assume that the projected to come online in the first quarter, let's say. Then you'd get most of the depreciation. So I assume I'm taking it, it's more conservative to assume more depreciation. So let's assume that we are at the full head of depreciation. This is going to be the 14 billion divided by 20. And I'm going to anchor this. All right, so the idea is the, the, the CapEx that comes in in 2013 will also add to your 2013 depreciation. <coughs> now, the next year, 2014, there's an additional 15 billion in CapEx. That's not going to create depreciation in 2013, but that'll create depreciation in 2014. So in 2014, we're going to calculate the depreciation on that 15 billion. And for now, I'm going to also assume that the, the useful life is going to be 20. So in 2014, I'm going to take depreciation at, at that 15 billion divided by 20 years. Now I'm going to anchor the numerator and denominator so that I can copy this to the right. So now we have depreciation on the core property, on 2013 property, and on 2014 property. Right? It's stacking on top of each other. And we do the same for 2015. I'm going to assume, again, 20 years of useful life. And I'm going to depreciate that CapEx that won't come online until 2015, which is taking the 15.9, anchoring it, and dividing it by the 20. I'm using F4 as a quick way to anchor the numerator or denominator. And in 2015, the depreciation is 798.5. And then in 2016, I'm going to again assume 20 years for now. Now I'm going to take the 16927, anchor it, divide by the 20, anchor that. And I'll do the same for 2017. I assume 20 years. And I'm going to take the 17.9, anchor that, divided by the 20, anchor that. 
So that's the total depreciation, right? So in the end, we have depreciation on the 112 in net PPD, and then depreciation on the property that we built in 2013, plus the depreciation in 2014, and so on. And we have it all stacked on top of each other, and we total up the columns. So in K19, we can just do it all equals. That adds everything up. A total of 9622. And we can copy that to the left. And that's the book depreciation that we've estimated, assuming that the useful life is going to be 20, but it might not always be. So we've got to change this. So this is the core straight line depreciation. This is the depreciation that we use in the future cash flow statement, as well in the future income statement, and in the future cash flow statement. Let's continue. I really want to get through as much of depreciation as we can. Depreciation is tricky. Um, in the second exam, the valuation exam, um, you'll have to build a, a little model, a little valuation. And I think if you guys remember the depreciation, not you, but a, a lot of people kind of, you know, messed it up, right? Or was it working capital? One of those. So my point is, that's even six weeks into it. So don't, 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 and then you guys end up doing all right towards the end. Don't feel bad if, if this is still a lot of information at this point, yeah? <clears throat> then it's easier to find. And part of it is, you know, there's also a difference between do you have a template, can you update a template, versus can you actually build a depreciation schedule from scratch, which is why we have to do on the, on the exams. But remember, that's, that's, more, that's for you guys, right? Test for you guys. That, that second exam, not the next one, the second one was, was an actual case study that, that somebody had gotten now quite a few years ago, but had a bullish bracket back. So it's good prep for you guys as well. Okay, so now we have depreciation down. The question is, is this accurate? It's going to be inaccurate. Why is it going to be inaccurate? It's always going to be inaccurate, but why is it mostly inaccurate? Because we're assuming the useful life is different than what it actually is. And why, yes, yes, the useful life is different than what it actually is. The actual useful life is three, and from three to forty. Right. Why else is it inaccurate? <clears throat> yes, Paul. Because we assume the current uh, PPD uh, are going to depreciate for twenty more years. Yeah, which yep. that's a big point. We're taking the net PPA and redepreciating from scratch. Redepreciating at the useful life that they defined way back when they purchased the asset. So this is where you can, and I, I see a lot of analysts try to break down depreciation schedule into small segments, into my property segments. You're never going to really be able to back into the actual depreciation that they have unless you have an actual log of every property that they purchased, the actual purchase price, the depreciation at the time of purchase, and have a model built all the way from the beginning of that purchase, which you can never do. You'll never get that information. Maybe if you're at a certain level of, of, of diligence, the company would have those files. Even if they do, you would really never put it in a model to that detail. Maybe in some situations you would. I never had to do it. But in order to get a depreciation that matches what they have, you can't depreciate based on the net value. You need to depreciate based on the gross value. And you can't just take that gross value and divide it by 20 because you're basically saying that, that depreciation is starting today. It's been depreciated for X number of years. The depreciation from here on out should be 15 if it has 15 years of depreciation left. Nine if it had nine years of depreciation left. That's, that's the way to back into the actual number, and you'll never get that information. You'll never know when they purchased the item, what the actual purchase price was, and between that 3 and 40 range, when did they start that? So, you know, I see a lot of people try to break this up by asset class. That's not enough. You need, you need timing. You need the gross value. You're not going to have that. So there's another way to, to kind of back into an appropriate level of depreciation. And there's comfort in knowing, I can go back to the income statement, most of the time, 99% of the time, depreciation 
is going to be consistent, steady, and slowly climbing. Slowly climbing based on the capex that's being produced. So no matter how you project depreciation, it should continue that trend. So I've seen, you know, when I was an associate, I've looked at a lot of models and, and saw all this detailed depreciation, analysts spending hours back in depreciation, and they would never step back and think about where it's going. They'd be in the details, and then you'd see $8 billion and then $5 billion. And you know that no matter how much you've engineered it, it's wrong. It's wrong. There's no way it would drop to $5 billion unless they've sold half their assets, which Walmart's not going to do, um, or unless assets are depleted. So most of the time, the main point of this, the depreciation is something that's added back anyway in your valuation. You want to just make sure you're getting a steady trend. So I'm going to back into a useful life that represents an aggregate of how much depreciation is left based on the net, which is really what you want. Um, and that shows an appropriate trend. That's the best way to back into it at a higher level. Until you get detail from the company that lists all the information on every single property, and even when you get that, you're never going to model it out to that detail. So this is what I recommend doing. First of all, I'm going to pull in the depreciation, the straight line depreciation for the past three years so we can look at trends. So I'm pulling in 2012. You don't have to do this, but, but you can just watch. But I can pull in the 2012 depreciation from the income statement. And I'm going to cover this back two years. And already we can see there's something wrong, right? It was climbing 71, 76, 81, and then it dropped to 6. How much has it been climbing? I'm going to calculate a growth formula so I can analyze trends. I'm going to look at the growth from 2011 to 2010. That's going to be equal to 2011. Minus one. Two thousand eleven. Divided by two thousand ten. Minus one. And then I copy this all the way through and convert to a percentage. This is just temporarily to analyze. So right now we have seven percent, six, seven percent growth. And then it's cut fully two percent. It's not going to happen. Not going to happen at all. So what I recommend as a quick way of analyzing this is to adjust these years to back into an appropriate number that represents of consistent and steady growth. So first of all, my depreciation should be closer to eight, eight and a half billion, or seven to six percent above, so maybe eight point eight billion, above the eight point one three. That's what this should be. So in order to get this number up, I need to bring this number down. Right? If I bring this number down to fifteen my depreciation should go up, right? I'm, I'm dividing it the denominator by less years. So this five billion should, should jump, right? And it does, it goes up to seven. So that's good, right? That's better than negative 22%, but it's not a big enough job. So let me drop this down further and then drop this down to 10. That's why I use the book. Um, that's too much, right? That doubles. So the lower I drop that, obviously the larger the base PPA becomes. So when I was at 15, it was about 1% growth. When I was at 10, it was a little bit too much. Let me increase that a little bit. I'll increase it to 12. And 
that helps lower the book depreciation a little bit, but not enough to get me to a steady trend. If I do 14, I add a couple, then that looks pretty good. Seven percent. The point is to play around with increasing and decreasing the PPE years until I get to a trend that falls in line with the years before. Now I have a second problem. Although that's great in the first year, it's a little high in the latter years. Well, seven percent. It should be around seven six percent. Now it's nine eight. A little too high. I want to see consistent six seven percent. What's causing this jump? The stacking of the capex. So I want to raise the capex years so that this lowers a little bit to adjust the year over year growth. So if I change that capex to about, let's say, up to 25, then there I'm at 6 7%. That's perfect. You can break this out, you can engineer the depreciation as much as you want, spend hours and hours and hours. If I don't see this trend, something is wrong. So these are one of those areas where I believe they easily get over-engineered depreciation. So the point is, take an arbitrary number, take the midpoint, take the range, build out depreciation, and then slowly play around with the years. The PPE, because that's the biggest chunk, is what you'd adjust first to get to the core level of book depreciation that's in line with the historic levels, the pp &E. The year-to-year -year growth is impacted by the CapEx because it's that CapEx that stacks on year-to-year -year and that adjusts your year-over-year -year growth. See what I'm saying? So we'll do this quite a few times. Read about it in the book, and this is where the internship has value. You gotta just practice this in, you know, with with real companies. Well, this is a real company, but this is so big, you know. You gotta face this issue, and you gotta play around with it, and you know, really struggle with it. So it'll take some time. <clears throat> That's straight line depreciation. The straight line depreciation. Now we can link back into the income statement. Right, so we can link this back into the income statement. So on the income statement, I'm going to link in the depreciation from the depreciation schedule. Straight line depreciation always begins the in start always links into the income statement. <coughs> Go to the right. I'm going to take out the highlight because we've added that in. So we should have three, four, eight, two, seven point three in EBIT. Have that. And the depreciation should also go into your cash flow statement. So depreciation amortization was empty. We can link that in from the depreciation schedule. I'm going to link it in from the income statement just to illustrate that it's this exact depreciation that we want to pull into the cash flow. Sir, can you go over that one more time? Yep. Yeah. The links? Yeah. Yep. So with that straight line depreciation links into the, the income statement. So on the income statement, G23, we have equals depreciation G19. Okay. You can copy that to the right. And then that links into the cash flow. On well, the cash flow statement, we have G9 in the cash flow statement equal to G23 in the income statement. Mm -hmm.
Converting the cash flow to the depreciation schedule first and then make the income statement to the cash flow. You, you could have, but it's kind of backwards logic. You could. Technically, it won't change. Okay. Everyone have that? <clears throat> now I want to talk about accelerating, depre accelerating depreciation. So for Walmart, if you notice underneath the straight line depreciation schedule, there's an accelerated depreciation portion where we're going to assume that the PPE is going to accelerate. So I mentioned before, there's a couple of reasons why a company would want to accelerate depreciation. One is because it believes that this property might accelerate faster. Two is it creates a deferred tax liability that might provide some cash flow benefit. So the question is, what is a deferred tax liability? You guys know? You owe taxes, so it's... You owe taxes. Paid. You, uh, it's on the, based on the revenue, you, you're charged for less tax today versus what you're going to own in the future. Yeah, um, yeah. So you're, you're deferring your revenue, pay them later, and deferred tax liabilities are come up from timing differences in accounting. So companies report two books, two sets of books, right? One for GAAP, one general acceptable accounting principles. Um, and then in the US, one for tax purposes, right? And you are allowed to adjust the way some things get reported, which would encourage a deferred tax liability. One of those things is the way you depreciate assets. So you are allowed to report, for example, for GAAP purposes, straight line depreciation, while for tax purposes, accelerating the depreciation on your assets. Why would you do that? That would give you some cash benefits in having to record taxes that you don't have to right away pay. So let me give you an example of that. Um, let's say we have two companies. Oh, you're not going to be able to read that. Let's say you have two companies. I'll try to zoom in. If not, I'll just explain it. Can I zoom? Ah, it says it's zooming, but it's not zooming. The, the nature of this online PowerPoint. I should not use in the future. But I'll, I'll keep this on the board and I'll explain it. I'll keep this on the wall and I'll explain it on the board. So in this case, let's say we have two companies. Let me erase this. We have two companies that have revenue, operations, gross profit of about 7500 they have expenses, EBITDA of 5K. Let's see. This company A is producing two sets of financials. These are GAAP financials, and these are tax financials. Okay? This is reported publicly, sent to taxes, right, sent to the government. <coughs> EBITDA 
this minus s. Now let's say that the company has decided to change the way it depreciates from gap versus tax. So they're going to have straight line depreciation, which will produce the fifteen hundred that we talked about, the truck company, right? The twenty thousand minus five thousand divided by ten. That's fifteen hundred. So let's say that's a straight line. But for tax purposes, it's decided to accelerate its depreciation, which gives it thirty-seven fifty. Right? So what happens? So now it has EBIT. Do I do any other expenses in there? I assumed interest was zero. Okay. EBIT of thirty-five hundred and twelve fifty of EBIT. And so when you're taxed, what do they do? Thirty-five percent? When they tax at forty percent, this is fourteen hundred. This is five hundred. So what's happening is here, the straight line depreciation, the higher, the lower depreciation, shows a higher net income, which is beneficial to report for EPS purposes for shareholders. But on the negative side, shows that you're required to pay higher taxes. So for tax purposes, you accelerate the depreciation, which gives you a lower reportable tax, and you pay lower taxes. So in other words, you've expensed, even though you've expensed fourteen hundred, you only have to pay five hundred. So that the, that difference becomes a payable. Five hundred payable. That's for taxes. Okay. So the the idea of adjusting the way you depreciate for tax purposes from gap purposes allows that difference to play out. Now the reason why I'm explaining it this way is because in modeling, and this is you know this is an interview question that you know analysts model things this way time and time again, but they never think through why it is the way it is. In modeling, what we do is we model out a straight line depreciation, then we model out accelerated depreciation, and at the end we subtract the two. Right? So we do accelerated minus straight line, 2250. We model out straight line depreciation. We don't model out two income statements. Right? We don't have all this information. But you can find out from the company financials if they if they openly state that they'll accelerate the depreciation for tax purposes, then you model out straight line depreciation, you model out accelerated depreciation, you subtract the two, and if you multiply 2250 times 40 percent, that gives you 900. That gives you the amount of deferred taxes that's saved. So what this is illustrating is, in reality, that $900 is coming from the idea that you have a higher accelerated depreciation, the higher depreciation, the higher expense, causes lower net income, lower taxes. But in modeling, what we're doing is we're just backing into that tax savings by subtracting the straight accelerated depreciation from the straight line and multiplying it by the tax rate. That's going to take a lot of thinking about and sitting and sitting with. That's in the slides. But think about that. Think about what this is trying to do. Right? The whole point is you are you are basically increasing an expense to reduce income. It doesn't mean you're not owed that income, but you're just reducing it in the short term. And that's why in modeling we model out an accelerated we model out a straight line, we subtract the two and multiply by the tax rate. So when we look at the accelerated depreciation here, we're gonna we're gonna build out the accelerated depreciation. We're gonna take accelerated depreciation, subtract it from the straight line, multiply it by the tax rate, and that's gonna give us our deferred tax liability. That's one way of getting deferred taxes. Okay. So the, the point is generally. Deferred taxes is, is, is created, a deferred tax liability is created from timing differences between reporting or gap reporting for taxes, right? The idea of accelerating depreciation 
is one way of creating the per tax liability. And it's important to, to throw in on that because you do that a lot in banking. There are other items that you can adjust tax versus gap, like um, recording costs of goods sold. Right, last in, first out, versus first in, first out, or first and last, or life bulb, life bulb, who was the other one? Who's the third one? And there, there's different ways of reporting cons and costs from gap purposes versus tax purposes, all of which those differences could influence some sort of adjustment in taxes and be a deferred tax liability. You're not avoiding paying them at all. You're, you're, you're owing them at some at some point. You're just deferring their payments in the beginning, hopefully for enough cash flow the short term. That's the idea. So when when looking at that, let's build out the accelerated depreciation. And because this is a US-based company, I'm going to take out these metrics so we don't need them. Walmart is going to most likely, well, is going to have to, if they're accelerating the depreciation, use the maker schedules. So the maker schedules can be found online. I have a link to it in the book. Um, there, if you have the book pasted into page, I pasted them all. I pasted the links from where they come from. 95, 96, 97. And if you if you see them, um, they are tables that reflect percentages based on the useful life of the company. So there's a three year, for example, that shows accelerated depreciation for a company that has a three year useful life. There's a five year, there's a seven year, there's a 10 year, there's a 15 year, and there's a 20 year. Notice there's a table on page 95 and a table on page 96. The one on 95 is called the Maker's Half-Year Convention. This assumes that the property will not come online until the first half of the year. So this is where timing can be a factor. So what I mean is this. If you see a, a three-year, if a company has a three-year useful life and it's straight line, right? This should be 33 and a third, right? 33 and a third. That's the straight line depreciation, basically, over three years, right? Um, so if you're using the, let's say, double declining balance method, right? This should be 66.67, right? And it should decline accordingly, right? If you look at page 95, the half year convention, year one in the three year is 33.33%. That's not accelerating, is it? That's like the straight line. Why is it like that? Well, what this is assuming is, it's assuming that that property is not going to start depreciating until the middle of the first half of the year. So it's actually really giving it a 66.6% .6 value, but it's saying, let's take the value and cut it in half, because in the first year, I'm not going to get that full depreciation. That's the half-year convention. The half-year convention says the property is not going to come online in the first year. If you go to the page 96, and it, it's there's a mid-quarter convention, which implies that the property is going to be placed in service in the first quarter, and that percentage is actually 58.33%. That's accelerated. That's very close to 66.6%. That's as conservative as you can get, or that's as high as you can get. In other words, there are different conventions. There's one where they assume that it will start depreciating in the first quarter. That's the mid-quarter convention. There's one where it assumes that it's not going to start depreciating until half the year. That's the mid-year mid um, convention. There's one for the second quarter. There's one for the third quarter. There's one basically one for every quarter. 
I always use this one, the one on page 96, because that gives you the highest percentage and shows the most differential. But you can tweak accordingly depending on the timing in the deal, which we'll start to look at later. As a rule, I just always use the one on page 96 in the beginning. And so the different percentages are based on different lives. So we have to look at the PPD now. Now the second problem here is the PPD we have in here is 14. There's no 14. There's no there's no useful life for a company that has 14 years of depreciation. So I'm going to use the 15-year percentages. That's close enough. So the 15-year percentages, I want to hard code in to this section. So there's this section of accelerated depreciation here, which is for the percentages. So for existing pp and &E, I'm going to copy the percentages from, nine, from page 96, which is 15 years, 8.75%, then 9.13%, then 8.21, 7.39, 7.25, that's going to be the percentages we're going to use to depreciate the pp &E. So I got that by using the table on page 96. That's what I always use for makers. And then I want to find what's close enough to 14, which is 15. I use the 15 year percentages. And so we're going to use those percentages to apply to the core value of PP&E to create our accelerated depreciation. And the way that's going to work is that first 121 million is going to depreciate by 8.75%, then 9.13, then 8.21, then 7.39, then 6.65. So in the next section, this first section is just to lay out our percentages. The next section is to lay out the actual value for existing pp &A. I'm going to have this equal to 8.75 times the property. 8.75% times the 1, 1, 2, 3, 2, 4. It's 9828. Because G21 times G6. Value the That's how you do a straight line. I mean, accelerated. Value the property times the percentage. <laughs> Notice if I copy to the right, I'm going to get a zero. I'm going to get a zero because it's multiplying 9.13 times nothing. And while I want it to multiply by 9.13, I want it. I want it to multiply it by G6. So in other words, I want this reference to be anchored, but the reference to the percentages to continue to shift. So when I copy to the right, I want the numerator or the left side of the equation to still reference G21, not H21. But I want it to multiply by H6. I want this to be fixed, and then I copy to the right, I want it to multiply by this, then by this, then by this, then by this. If I want to anchor the cell, and then I can copy the whole formula to the right, then I'll be okay. So in other words, in cell G28, I want to anchor the reference to G6. I'll put it, I'm going to F4 or put a dollar sign just around G6. I'm going to leave this one floating, so when I copy to the right, this will stay fixed and this will shift over. So it's equal to G21 times dollar sign G, dollar 6. I'll copy to the right. And that's the depreciation. So, so it, it is starting to decline. It's accelerated because it's higher in the book. Not as dramatic as an effect as to what I drew on the example, but I use the example so you can see the difference. Mm -hmm. We do the same for the CapEx. So on the CapEx, we had adjusted a 25-year depreciation. So if you notice in the table on page 96, the maximum percentage that they give you is the 20 year. So I'll use the 20 year. So 20 year is 6.563. 6.563. 6.563. 6.563. 6.563. 6.563. 6.563. 6.563. 6.563. 6.563. 6.563. 6.563. 6.563. 6.563. 6.563. 6.563. 6.563. 6.563. 6.563. 
5.546. So I'm going to use those percentages. Notice the third decimal, 6.563. 7, When we calculate the CAPEX, by multiplying the CAPEX by the first percentage. So we're going to take the CAPEX of 14213 times 6.56. the same CAPEX, so be careful when you copy to the right. We want to reference the same CAPEX, but it's 7% of that CAPEX, so we want to anchor the reference to G, whatever, G7, and keep the G22 floating. So that G7, I'm going to put dollar signs around, and I'm going to copy this to the right. <clears throat> For the next year, it's CapEx that doesn't begin in 2014, so I'm going to, it's going gonna, it's gonna to depreciate, this CapEx starting in 2014 is going to depreciate at 6.56 in 2014, 7 in 2015, 6, 4, 8, etc. So we're going to shift all the percentages to the right, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to copy the first four percentages to begin under 2014. That's the way I'm going to do it. Right, so the just like we did for straight line, because that 2014 PPE doesn't doesn't start its first depreciation until this column, that 2014 depreciation is going to depreciate at 6.56 percent. You're starting that depreciation from scratch, seven percent the next year, and so on. So what I'm going to do is the depreciation doesn't begin until age 30, and age 30. I'm going to take the 2014 depreciation and I'm going to multiply it by that 6.56. You're starting it again. Don't think that that's multiplied by 7%. I see a lot of people make that mistake. New depreciation, new CapEx, new property, starting again at the accelerated rate. And again, as I'm copying to the right, I want to anchor the reference to H7. Yeah, and so on. So I'd like you to finish up for homework. It would be a good way for you to sit with it, practice it, think it through. I don't expect you to fully understand it now, but 
when we do it again for Office Depot, Office Max, for Heinz, for, you'll, and when you do it in the internship, you'll start to slowly gain more confidence in it. So I'd like you to read the depreciation piece that talks about this stuff. I'd like you to finish just the accelerated depreciation. Tomorrow we'll talk about accelerated versus straight line, linking that into the cash flow, getting into working capital. Really moving along quickly. Again. Next week we'll complete the model and start talking about how to utilize it as a, as a tool. Any questions?